CEO entrepreneur born in 1964, Jeffrey, Jeffrey Bezos, is doing extremely well in his investment in Perplexity AI. Perplexity is, of course, that AI-powered search engine. It searches the web and it kind of summarizes all the sources for you. I've been using quite a bit, as you can see here in my search history, what is Stability AI? What is Gaussian? Whatever. Then this is around the time that I got sick earlier this week. Are dehydration bad? I wasn't feeling too good. I'm not sure what I was asking. And then we're back to breakthroughs, rumors, and D&D &D creatures. But that's Jeff Bezos. But you might recall not that long ago, Forbes used some sort of CIA technology to dox an anonymous Twitter account. Apparently, they used some sort of a CIA technology to match his voice to the recordings of the voice of his alter ego and found out that he was this ex-Google engineer who used to work on quantum computing, but is now on his own, and revealed his identity. And his alter ego's name was Beth Jezos, not to be confused with Jeff Bezos. And Beth Jezos wasn't happy about that. Not one bit. See Exhibit A. Not happy. He even showed up on the Lex Friedman podcast to talk about it. Not Jeff Bezos, Beth Jezos. Or his real name is Guillaume Verdon. Really fast, I think this might be a good way of uh, understanding what's happening right now. This line right here, the orange line, that's the end of classical. Classical what? Classical music? No. That day will never come. We have this idea called the Moore's Law, that the number of transistors or microchips roughly doubles every two years. This chart is showing 1970 to 2020. So 50 years of the Moore's Law upholding pretty well. But the problem with this is as this gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, all this has to fit on a smaller and smaller space. We you might say, are almost approaching a, a wall of some sort. So just to give you an idea, as an example, a gate oxide layer. So it's an insulating layer. So kind of like thermal underwear that you put on outside if it's cold. But some of this stuff is approaching the point where it's several atomic layers thick. So I think some of it is like two layers of atoms thick. So we are kind of approaching the end of sort of classical physics. So what happens when we need something that's less than one atom? Do we just split the atom and keep going? Well, yes, but not for this application. To continue, we need to exit the familiar classical and enter the weird and scary thermodynamic and quantum computing, or at least some other approach that doesn't rely on some of the things that we've been doing so far. That could be quantum computing, neuromorphic, some sort of a new 3D chip architecture, perhaps new materials. Which brings us back to Guillaume Beth Jesus Verdon and his company Xthropic, where he's saying he found something that's better than, potentially better than, quantum computing. By the way, this is Gary Tan. He's the CEO of Y Combinator. He's going to appear in the video as well. The first interview I saw about this was on his channel. And Gary Tan does not like the people running San Francisco. And he's not shy about it. With that out of the way, let's take a look. Moore's law is coming to an end. And at a moment where compute is more important than ever. What we were seeing is that actually the semiconductor industry and the AI industry at large is hurtling towards this wall. We call it Moore's wall. Current demand for AI is just scaling extremely rapidly. As we know, every GPU is always sold out. Models just want to get bigger and bigger. They want to use more and more data and they want to use more and more energy. And people are proposing, hey, let's create nuclear power plants that power huge clouds to scale up to AGI. We think there's another way forward. The old school way of scaling things is to try to make your transistor smaller and smaller. That's Moore's law. It's the driving force behind much of the innovation that we've seen in Silicon Valley. But that has come to an end because we're nearing the limits of transistors being able to fire reliably. So what we're building at Extropic is a full stack physics-based computing paradigm focused on AI. And so we're really excited today to share more about our approach. We have the light paper that folks are probably reading right now. And we've released some images of our first chips. Here you have our very first chips. They're very small. <laughs> you could probably hold them and look at them, but they're made out of superconductors. And those are the most efficient neurons in the universe. We call them neurons very loosely. They're analog stochastic circuits. So this is a non-digital approach. Why is it so much better? Why is it so much faster? 
these algorithms of sampling that we mentioned, these Monte Carlo algorithms, maybe if you, you optimize your code, you get maybe a hundred or a thousand steps per second. Electrons fluctuate nearly a hundred billion times a second on, on this chip, about 80 billion times a second. So that's a massive speed up. We're using the power of nature to go much faster with this class of algorithms. And that's the magic of what are called energy-based models, which are the models that our chips run natively as a physical process. Shout out to Yann Lacan, who's a big fan of those. <laughs> and we think they're the future of machine learning algorithms. This is the beginning of something much bigger. What do you hope will come to you as a part of this launch today? For people to understand, hey, actually, LLMs aren't the final evolution of algorithms and um, FPGAs, TPUs, ASICs on digital computers aren't the end game of hardware. We're looking for the most talented people who want to help us really scale this Manhattan project for AI. Really, we're trying to save the world here because if we don't solve how to embed AI much more efficiently into the physics of the world, we're not going to be able to scale intelligence to the entire planet and to create the massive prosperity that scaling AI can give us. Yeah, did you see that thing about how LLMs with Claude 3 just reached 103 IQ <laughs> and then GPT-4 was around 80-ish right. and then later this year, the next versions, are they going to be at 110, 120? And then soon they'll surpass genius level. We kind of need to accelerate here. Yeah. Now, you may have noticed a pattern here. Before we go on, I do want to address it really fast. So we have Jan Lacoon, the AI boss at Meta slash Facebook, a French speaker, Guillaume Verdon, another French speaker. We also have Mistral AI from Paris, France, giving us the option to talk to Les Chats and build on La Plateforme. You might be asking yourself, why are some of the top tier AI developers French? I think a lot of this has to do with the unfortunate naming of ChatGPT. You see how you say ChatGPT in French. You know how we sometimes adapt certain words, like we don't say niche, we say niche. We kind of Americanize certain words. Well, instead of saying ChatGPT, in French you would say ChatGPT. G is J, P is P, T is T. So GPT would be GPT. Here's the problem. ChatGPT means in French, and I kid you not, Google it, cat. I farted. It's like you're confessing to your cat. So I think what happened is that the smartest French speakers all over the world got together and decided they did not, in fact, want to reference the greatest intelligence that mankind has ever created as GPT. And they decided to dominate the field so that they can have control over which names are and are not allowed to use to refer to various AIs and AGIs. And if you're thinking this is silly, there's no way that a nation and all of its descendants would put so much thought and energy into protecting what something can or can't be called. Look up the whole story behind Champagne. I apologize if that tangent got a little bit too weird. That was meant to be lighthearted and humorous, but both Beth Jezos and Jan LeCun, both of them independently of each other, are pointing out the potential problems we could face if the government regulation of AI is too strong. If some of the special interests manage to lobby the government enough to outlaw open source models, open source AI, where somebody would need a license to even train these models, which that is unfortunately still on the table. That is still being talked about. And Jan and Beth have been calling it out, showing examples where some potentially authoritarian motives towards AI are detected. On the positive side, the amount of different people everywhere in the world, across all parts of the world, working on AI, improving their models, or building tools centered around various AI applications, the innovation in that space is absolutely breathtaking. But the future looks bright. And I guess it's very interesting that we're beginning to build on a level that's beyond matter, beyond atoms. We to see massive progress in terms of our ability to generate inexpensive energy, producing next generation computer chips, a massive explosion of intelligence. Each of those things empowering all the other things in a sort of a virtuous cycle. Life is about to get wild. Stay alive. My name is Wes Roth and thank you for watching.